Hi, I'm Troy Saliba. I'm Animation Director at uh, Double Negative. When it comes to your own role, can you talk a little about how advances in technology have made your life a little bit easier these days? Hmm. I mean, for me, it's really just better, faster um, computers to process these things faster. Much of what I do is still nested in history. Basically, everything I learned from my 2D days is still applicable to this. And as the process has evolved and the relationships with the clients and the way we work with uh, filmmakers has changed, the basic foundation of what we do is very much the same. So technology doesn't affect what I do as directly as it does other people. Um, I haven't started dabbling with VR or anything like that, which will probably change everything I know about what I do, so we'll see. What are your thoughts, because we're seeing in different areas of uh, filmmaking and effects, the, the move to real time having on things? Uh, I could see that making a big difference, particularly when you're on set and when you're in pre-production and trying to get a cut together much earlier than you would normally be able to do. You have to wait for post fits to be done and things like that before the filmmakers can really Visualize what, visualize what they've got, but with the, the real-time playback with environments and soon with characters, um, it's going to make it easier for the actors and it's going to make it easier for the editors and the directors to see what they've got right away. Can you talk a little about the focal point of your talk? Um, the talk centers mostly around the uniqueness of Venom and how he's very much um, a melding of animation and effects together. You can't really talk about the animation on this movie without talking about the effects, and that's why um, when I uh, first thought about coming here and talking about the movie, I asked Erin if she would come because she kind of spearheaded all the, the dev and effects side of Venom, and to me that's as big a part of the character as the anim, so that's what we're going to talk about. What were the biggest challenges in bringing this uh, character to the big screen? Uh, aside from having sort of the different facets of Venom, because he starts out as kind of an amorphous, um, highly textured, unusual character, and eventually manifests himself as a full, you know, muscular creature, just the scope of the movie, there's just so much of it, and the, the whole third act being, um, you know, fully rendered CG environments and CG cameras and all this dynamic action you had to work out, just a big, complex movie. Is it something that even a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do just from a technology standpoint? Uh, that may be a question Erin's better suited to ask, because um, a lot of what she does, even though I understand the concepts behind it, technically I don't quite know what the limitations would have been, say, if we tried to do this five years ago, I don't know. Um, Animation-wise, uh, you know, the rigs got pretty complex, and some of that may have been a challenge a few years ago, given how robust some of these things needed to be. Can you talk about your side of the equation and, and, and how you guys work together to bring this character to life? Yeah, I mean, everything that me and my team did was all about, you know, establishing how these characters move and helping the, you know, the director and the editor build these cuts and figure out how these moments are going to play out. Um, especially when you have a filmmaker that's used to being able to capture everything in camera and now he's got this character that doesn't exist and sometimes entire scenes that he can't shoot. Um, helping him sort of realize that and how that's all gonna play out is a big part of what we do, aside from actually executing the animation of the character. Outside of the animation is, is since you are dealing with real actors today, are we also incorporating any type of performance or motion capture into this character? Sometimes, not so much motion capture directly into the character himself, um, not in aid of trying to you know, make it feel like the actor Tom Hardy. Um, if the character was doing something that was meant to be grounded in reality, if he was you know, walking and talking, we would either shoot reference or, or go and do a mocap session, uh, whatever was relevant. But most of what he did was something that, thing, you know, with, there were things that people couldn't do. So it was all you know, keyframe and it all had to sort of be conceptualized, prevised, and you know, brought to life that way. Like that motorcycle sequence, pretty out there. Yeah, yeah, that, that was something they, they shot a lot of practical things and then a lot of things we just had to invent because they just couldn't capture it on the day. What were the challenges when you guys did have that mono a mono battle there at, at, at the end of the film? Well, the biggest challenge then was it was something that uh, 
you know, wasn't first and foremost in the filmmaker's mind as they were shooting because they were trying to deal with that, you know, circus and keeping that flowing. And then when we were done, they sort of had some rough previs, but it wasn't, you know, it hadn't been realized nearly to what it could have been. It wasn't dynamic. And the process of figuring out how that scene was going to play out was uh, quite an exhaustive process. We had to do, um, we had to go in and try and stage a bunch of actions and figure out what the cameras are going to be and then go through this process of getting that vetted through the director and the editors and the executives at Sony until finally we built a scene that felt exciting and you know we had done something that was three times longer than it is now and had to rein it back and it was a it was a process to get it down to where it was but it was it was fun for us because often in these movies you get these live action cameras and it's not staged the way you would like to do the action you would like whereas in that moment, we were able to put the camera where we want and you know, make, these, make, make these things flow the way we wanted so that the energy in each shot could build up to you know, a certain point and we had control over that, so it was good. Uh, the characters themselves in the, in the battle, they're very similar looking. What challenges did that open up in making sure the audience it was, was aware? It was really tough in that sequence because the decision was made um, actually well after we got into the sequence. Uh, originally, it was a day sequence and the decision was made part way through to turn it to a nighttime sequence and that made telling them apart even harder. Um, so you know I know that in, in lighting and comp they tried to pick up the silver kicks on Riot as much as they could to help separate them. Other than that it was just a staging thing trying to always make sure that Riot was in the dominant position you know so you kind of get used to that language. There's only a short beat where Venom tries to fight back and then he, it's just about Riot sort of dominating until the end of the sequence. We just had to use that sort of visual language. And even between those two characters, uh, what were the challenges of, of not necessarily for the fight, but differentiating them as characters? Um, I mean, the characters were very different. Um, Venom is sort of a multi dimensional, wisecracking, he's a full fledged character. Riot is kind of, he has two modes angry and more angry. Um, so the language of, of, of how they looked and how they moved was different. He was sort of sharper and, and more crude and um, his weapons tend to manifest themselves in sharp objects, pointy axes and swords, and, whereas Venom is sort of, sort of more amorphous and gooey. And, um, you know, he's capable of biting someone's head off, of course, but um, the shapes that he makes are more round and sort of liquidy, whereas Riot is very sort of crystalline and sharp and jagged. How do you feel when you look at what's been happening just in the Marvel Universe, all of the, the visual effects and animation uh, pushes over the last 10 years mm -hmm. impacted what people now expect to see when they watch a movie like Venom? Well, the standards are obviously very, very high. Um, one of the things that attracts me to a movie like Venom is I tend to like character-centric work. And because it's about Venom and sort of the evolution of Venom and Eddie and their relationship and how they learned to live with each other, um, that was something that attracted me. Um, I love doing the big action you know, scenes, um, but when things get too epic and we get too distant from the characters, it doesn't hold my interest as much. So a movie like Venom is more in my real life. And what was it like for you guys when you saw the $80 million opening and all the records the movie has broken? You know, it's always good when people go see these things, right? It's uh, uh, you know, it's a year and a half of your life, and it's nice to know that after you're done, people have seen it. So, yeah, it's great. And it's also nice to know at Marvel that they already give you kind of the post-credit where we're going next kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm imagining there's going to be another one. Yeah, for sure.